hear now the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 through 23. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and in field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. Now, Joseph was a handsome and good-looking man. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my hand. He's not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her. One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work, and while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called out to the members of her household and said to them, See, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard me raise my voice and cry out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Then she kept his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to insult me. But as soon as I raised my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, saying, This is the way your servant has treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison, and whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for joining us at Trinity today. My name is Kristen Brower, and I'm the director of family ministries here at Trinity. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith in love and in strength, to follow on your path you set before us. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Some of you may know that my favorite theologian is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I love Bonhoeffer so much that I named my three-year-old Maltese dog Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Isn't he so cute? He's joyful and calm and wins over and captivates others, much like his namesake, Dietrich. When reading the story of Joseph sitting in prison in Genesis 39, I can't help but think of my favorite theologian. Hear this story of Dietrich in prison. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a young German pastor who was executed by the Nazis for his role that he played in the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. While Bonhoeffer was in prison, his fellow prisoners were deeply impressed by his calmness and self-control, 
which Bonhoeffer displayed even in the most terrible situations. The guiding force in Bonhoeffer's life underlying all that he did, worked, and suffered for was his faith and love of God. It was in God whom Bonhoeffer found peace and happiness. It was from his faith that came the opportunity and he was able to, to split the gold in life from the dross of life. On October 8, 1944, Bonhoeffer switched prisons. Although fully aware that he was soon to be executed, he was perfectly calm. His brother-in-law, who was held in the same prison with him, wrote that Bonhoeffer was always cheerful, always consistently friendly and obliging, with the result that, to my surprise, it did not take him long to captivate the guards who were far from brimming over with human kindness. In his final hymn, Bonhoeffer expresses his trust in the sovereign God who gives endurance and hope in the dark world. Even in the harsh environment in which Dietrich Bonhoeffer found himself, there were powers for good that surrounded him and that were a source of comfort to him. In the third verse of his hymn that he wrote shortly before his death, Bonhoeffer puts this truth to us this way. And when this cup you give is filled to brimming, with bitter suffering hard to understand, we take it thankfully and without trembling, out of so good and beloved a hand. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Joseph had this kind of faith in God. They believed God's promise to be with them even in the most dire of circumstances. Let's look at Joseph's life up until now, up until Genesis 39. Joseph was 17 years old. He was his father's favorite son. His father chose him to be the head of the family, and his father gave him a beautiful robe to symbolize his authority. Joseph was on his way to success, power, and influence in his family. Everything seemed to be going well, and God was with Joseph. Ten of his brothers resented him because he was the favorite, and Joseph's brothers attacked Joseph, threw him in a pit, and sold him as a slave. Imagine the fear that must have filled his heart. Imagine the hurt that must have shattered him. Imagine the disappointment of shattered dreams and a life he didn't expect. But the presence of God was with him. But the story of Joseph doesn't end there. We get to Genesis 39 today and we see how Joseph got sold to Potiphar and Potiphar promoted Joseph and made him the overseer of his entire household. Joseph was in control of everything that happened in Potiphar's home and his business interest. Potiphar learned that he could trust Joseph to do the right thing. He soon discovered that Joseph was a man of industry and integrity, a man of character and conviction. He was a worker who did the best job that he could for his master. Joseph served Potiphar like he was serving the Lord, and God was present with Joseph. But the story doesn't end there. The story continues. Joseph refused the advances made by Potiphar's wife. She maliciously accused Joseph of harm. And when Potiphar heard his wife telling her version of the story, he became angry and stripped Joseph of his place of authority that he had given him. And Potiphar threw Joseph in prison. And God was present with Joseph. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. If you were Joseph, might you be asking, what is happening here? It sounds all too familiar, doesn't it? With the painful memory of his brothers casting him into the pit still fresh in his mind, 
Here he is once again, cast into the dungeon, even though he was innocent. Any of us might find ourselves bitter and angry at God. We may ask, where are you, God? Why has God brought me this far only to abandon and forsaken me? How could this happen? Where is the justice against the false accusation? Joseph knew the Lord would not never leave him nor forsake him. Because Joseph wasn't concerned with his circumstance, but rather with the presence of God. Joseph wasn't concerned with his circumstance, but rather with the presence of God. Regardless of whether he was a slave working for Potiphar, or now a prisoner for a crime he didn't commit, Joseph did not evaluate God's unmerited favor in his life based on his circumstances. Joseph held on to the hope that he had in God because Joseph knew that all his success was wrapped up in the presence of God. Joseph's success was not his wisdom or his strength or his gifts, but rather the Lord's favor. In Genesis 39, verses 21 through 23, the message version puts it this way. But there in jail, God was still with Joseph. He reached out in kindness to him. He put him on good terms with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners, and he ended up managing the whole operation. The head jailer gave Joseph free reign, never even checked in on him, because God was with him. Whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. Similar to Joseph, our success doesn't come in our circumstances. Our success comes in how we choose to show up in our circumstances, when we recognize that God is using each situation and each circumstance to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. We don't know what he has ahead for us. In Joseph's story, it's obvious to us, not to Joseph, how God was using his trials to shape him. God was using his circumstances and trials to shape him into a mature man of God who could handle the success which later would come to him. But what if Joseph didn't submit to God's hand in the trials? What if he sat in jail bitter and complaining and realizing the unfairness of the situation? How would that have changed the story? What would happen in Genesis chapters 40 through 50? What would it look like? But rather, Joseph didn't sit in his prison cell complaining about his unfair situation, but rather Joseph clung to God in faith while he was in prison praying. Maybe it went something like this. God, you promise me through my dreams a position of importance. I don't understand how this prison fits in with that, but I trust that you know what you are doing. Joseph realized that he could not control the situation he was in, but he could control how he reacted and showed up in the situation. How many of us have had to do that in this season of COVID? We we can't control what things are going to happen or we can't control the situation, but we can control how we show up when things get canceled, when plans change, when things don't look like we thought they were gonna look like. 
because we can't control situations, but we can control how we show up in them. And because of this, Joseph chose to grow from his situation. And when we choose to grow in our situations and in the change, like Ben talked about last week, we don't become bitter, but we become better. This is how we learn to trust God. This is how we need to trust God. We can all say that we know God is with us. We know God is faithful. That there are so many times in our lives when we just don't understand. We don't get it. It's not supposed to be this way. We want to hurry through the pain and the hardship. We want to get through it and be done. But God is always there. No matter what the circumstance, no matter how long it takes, God is always there in the middle of the valley, in the middle of prison, like Joseph was. We are not alone. God's presence helped Joseph succeed even in prison, even in a hard situation. So what does success look like for you in hardship? What does success look like in the middle of a circumstance that you wouldn't have planned or you wouldn't have chosen or the things that are hard and painful the things that involve disappointment and hurt. Success for us is trusting in God, leaning on his strength and the hope in God's faithfulness. The character of Joseph was developed in the pain of prison, in the heartbreak, in the misunderstanding, in the betrayal and isolation. And the same may be true for us. Our time in prison, our time in hardship is not in vain because it makes us more like Jesus. Joseph is a great model for us on what faithfulness to God looks like in all circumstances. In the hard places, it's difficult to see the presence of God. We want to understand why. Maybe it's the injury or the illness or diagnosis that leaves you weak and frustrated and angry. Maybe it's the draining frustration of never being the one chosen for the job. Maybe it's the fear of watching your kids make poor choices no matter how hard you pray for them. Maybe it's the weight of finances and money or broken or hard relationships. All those times that we didn't turn out, life didn't turn out the way that we expected it to happen. It's in these harsh realities that makes us swallow back tears. It makes the heartache that pumps sorrow through our veins. It's the suffering that seems forever long And we're disappointed that all of the things we have begged to go away are still present. Lisa Turkhurst, in her book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, describes it best. Lisa is in the midst of her her own prison, her own hard situation. In, In the book, she writes, hoping means I acknowledge reality in the very same breath that I acknowledge God's sovereignty. And she goes on to say that hope isn't tied to our expectations finally being met in my way and my timing. Our hope is not tied to whether or not the circumstances or another person changes. Our hope is not tied to whether or not we're even going to be able to get out of the prison. Our hope is tied to the unchanging faithfulness of God. Let me repeat that. Our hope is tied to the unchanging faithfulness of God. 
So where are those places in your life that you have had to tie yourself to the unchanging faithfulness of God? Maybe you find yourself in a hard place right now. What would it look like to invite the presence of God into your situation in a different way? What would it, it look like in your hardship, how difficult it may be to show up differently in it? If, if you find yourself past a hard place, past a hardship, as you look back, where are those places that you saw the faithfulness of God? Those places where blessings and gifts came even out of disappointment. Or for me right now, I find myself asking God to reveal his faithfulness and presence to me daily. Sometimes it's in small ways, a song on the radio or a rainbow or a butterfly, and other times it's large things on seeing answers to prayer and seeing God's presence show up in bigger ways. But where are you seeing the unchanging faithfulness of God in your life? As I was preparing for this sermon, in my preaching class, they, they often challenge us to think of people as you're preparing it and, and put it through their lenses. And as I was preparing this sermon, there were many people that came to mind who are living this hardship right now, who, who could say, I feel like Joseph and Dietrich Bonhoeffer in a hard situation. But early on in my preparation, I thought of my friend Stina and her husband Kenton, a story that is filled with pain and not understanding, but also two people who clung to the unchanging faithfulness of God, even in the midst of a hard situation. I'm Kenton Howie, and this is my wife Stina. Um, we've been going to Trinity for about five years now, and became members three years ago. We decided that we wanted to wait a year before we started having kids just to build a firm foundation with our marriage and uh, after that year was up we got pregnant right after and uh, and then shortly miscarried after that and um, it was a really hard time in our marriage but I was glad that we had that foundation built up. Um, we prayed a lot. I prayed that God would reverse the miscarriage. Uh, I knew that he could do big things and that if he wanted to save that baby and um, grow it to full term that he could do it. Um, Kenton went to Bible study and they prayed for us there and um, I feel like he was very faithful in praying for us in that season of life. Um, it led to a long time of trying to have more kids and God definitely provided in big ways for us. Uh, when our due date came and passed that year, um, a preschool family had also lost twins that they were pregnant with, and somebody else had lost, I think, a spouse, and someone else had lost a dad, and I was babysitting and just cried and cried and cried, because all of this had just compounded in a week's time. Um, and as I was doing dishes, I heard the Lord say, just trust me, I know your anxious heart. Um, I know what I'm doing in your life. And that brought so much peace. Um, I listened to the song Thy Will by Hilary Scott a lot and just trusted that God would provide in his own timing. We had talked about adoption at some point to grow our family and had decided that it could probably take years to get a baby. And um, we just decided that we'd start paperwork and see what the Lord did. And in a year's time from starting paperwork to our daughter being born, it went way faster than we thought it would. Um, we saw a lot of God's provision with prayers from friends and um, just support with fundraisers. People gave us baby things and um, also in that time we found out that we were pregnant and it was a really crazy couple of weeks <laughs> to find out that we'd get two babies at once. We found out that we were matched with Keslin on a Friday in December 
the following Friday, we found out that Stina was pregnant with Kendricks, and the following Friday after that, Keslin was born. And I think in that two years of waiting for kids and waiting to grow our family, it was definitely really hard. We had a lot of friends get pregnant and have babies, and um, my heart just ached for that. That's what I wanted more than almost anything else. So that was super hard, but um, God provided in really big ways, and we're really thankful for the two that we do have and the two babies that we have in heaven that we'll get to see someday. It's crazy at times, but I mean, God still gives us all the energy and the and guides us and leads us every day, and I, I wouldn't change a thing. Before we got married, a friend had prayed with me for our marriage and for babies, and I heard the Lord say the name Keslin, and so I held on to that as kind of my promise of babies that the Lord would provide someday, whether that was in a year or five years or ten years, but that we would have a baby girl. Um, so I just look back and see how he provided in more ways than we could have ever expected or imagined. Um, I had told Kristen that I had been praying for twins for years, which terrified him, but <laughs> she joined me in praying that prayer and God provided virtual twins. Um, people had told her that she was crazy for trusting God to do that big crazy thing and she said God can do whatever he wants so we're going to trust that he'll respond and he'll act and he'll show up um, and one of her middle names is Grace and he's full of mercy and we've seen God's favor and God's mercy over our journey to be parents and over her life that's just one story we, we all have stories, maybe you're in this story right now, but brothers and sisters in Christ hear this. Success is not going from birth to death, free from hardship or pain or trials. Success is the trust and faithfulness that we have in God through the hardship, the pain and the trials. Success is how we, we choose to show up with God and his presence in those circumstances. And maybe like Bonhoeffer, we can, we can sing and we can pray the words of that hymn. And when this cup you give is filled to brimming with bitter suffering hard to understand, we take it thankfully and without trembling out of so good and beloved a hand. Let's pray. God, we confess that there are days when it feels like you have forgotten us, maybe even abandoned us, because our battles have raged on for far too long. God, we confess that there are times we get tired of hoping, weary from waiting, and we wonder just how long it will go on. But God, we thank you for reminding us that there is a purpose to this process and that we are not walking through any of this alone, that you are our strength, that you are our hope, that you are our song, and help us to fix our eyes on you and your promises and remind us to keep our hope tied to you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>